Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another week. Today is Monday, May 11th. Very happy to have you with us today. And um, my name is Bettina Swigger. I am the CEO of Downtown Slow, the Downtown Association. Uh, with me facilitating the call is Garrett Olson. And Garrett Olson is with Resolute Associates. And we started working with Garrett prior to the COVID-19 emergency. Um, he was gonna be doing a strategic plan for our organization. And he has very graciously agreed to help usher us through this time um, as we all travel through what we're dealing with together. So I hope you all had a restful weekend. Um, to the mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. Um, and uh, we thank everybody for continuing to show up to these weekly calls. It looks like there are about 33 of you currently joining us. And I wish I could look you all in the eye and tell you thank you for being here. Um, it really is our job as the Downtown Association to bring people together. And it's been really challenging in this time to bring people together when it's not allowed um, and it's not safe. So thank you for being here in this virtual space. This marks the eighth week that we've been doing these calls. It's hard to believe how much has changed in the last two weeks um, and how much will continue to change over the weeks to come. Um, just a quick, for those of you who might be new to the call, some Zoom etiquette. Um, we recommend clicking speaker view in the top right. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the meeting, please just put those into the chat. We'll try to answer those um, as they come in. Many of us are becoming sort of Zoom professionals. And um, on this call, we do like to show you a slide. So we put some visuals together to try to break things up so it's not just a sea of talking heads. But do please um, throw things into the chat if you have topics that you'd like us to address either in this moment or um, on a future call. So um, our board of directors is on the call. Thank you all to you for your, your volunteer leadership in our organization. Um, in addition to these weekly calls, which are open to our membership and our stakeholders, we do have a closed board meeting tomorrow morning at 7.30. Um, so I've been in touch with all of you uh, with our agenda packet and we'll continue to address um, our organization's internal challenges as we deal with the COVID-19 emergency. Again, thank you to all of you for your leadership. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. So, Every week I show these four slides of kind of where we are um, and this four, I'm not gonna call it phases or steps uh, because we have a little too, too many discussions around different uh, types of iterations, but we are trying to still interpret our public health directives. We are in a public health emergency. We are trying to share information as fast as it comes to us. Um, I sent an email to all of our members on Saturday morning with some very helpful new information from the City of SLO regarding some resources they have for you. Um, and as well as the state is pushing out information and the county is pushing out information. We're waiting for economic relief. Um, we know that this is coming. Um, some of you have already received funding from the uh, CARES Act through the PPP or through IDLE or through the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Fund, um, but we also still know that recovery is months away. Uh, there were some very interesting articles this weekend in the New York Times, um, paper of record, which I, I'll call two out. One is the obituaries section has started doing a really remarkable series of portraits of the people who have died because of COVID-19, um, putting a face and a detail and some personal information behind just those statistics that we learn about. The other is that we are probably looking at a multi-year situation and Garrett will be talking about that in a minute. So with that, I'll give the floor to Garrett and he can talk us through our current reality. Um, so as of yesterday's numbers, it looks like I stuttered on the two, we're at 220, not 222 um, and still at one death and, and we've been holding firm at that for um, well over a month now. Um, CDC continues to make recommendations uh, regarding face masks and coverings um, and the shelter and home is in effect through March 16th. And as Bettina referenced, um, Start Guide was released by the county on May 1st uh, and, and there was some energy in, uh, and and belief that uh, last Friday we were going to be able to move into uh, what we're referring to as phase one within the county 
um, and found that that, uh, that is not coming to fruition or did not come to fruition. We've got Derek Johnson on the phone um, and hopeful that Derek can provide a little bit of information on how the state's stages um, translate or don't translate to the county's phases. Um, so the state is at phase two, the county is at, or yeah, as at stage two and the county is at pre-phase one. Um, and so awkward that there isn't a, a better translation between the two, um, but great though that our county is leaning forward and is one of the first counties to have a science-based plan for reopening. Um, we are still in the first wave um, and as you, <clears throat> excuse me, read in the news, um, the, the possibility of a second wave following even the, a modest amount of relaxation in social and physical distancing is quite likely um, and that this, grad, this recovery will be in stages um, and those stages will likely be years um, and, and we're still looking at a year or more before a vaccine is available, although there's some great energy around that issue. Um, most of the, the professionals in that field are still saying it's a year or more. Great, thank you so much, um, Garrett, for that. And uh, now we're gonna ask Judy Mahan from the Small Business Development Center to give us an update on what's going on in the SBDC world. Oops. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bettina. Thank you, good morning, everyone. Uh, so a few updates for everyone. Um, as you know, the PPP loan program is still available, it's still up and running. Uh, originally, when it was first when it first came out through the CARES Act, we had three hundred and forty nine billion dollars that was made available for the loan program. That was expended in four, fourteen days. Um, another round of funding was made available approximately a week ago. Three hundred and ten billion dollars in additional funds were made available nationally. Um, the PPP is still available. We know that as of Friday, $165 billion has been expended, has been spent. So we have about $145, $150 billion available still for PPP. Um, so half of it is gone. We're recommending to anyone who has not yet applied for a PPP loan to apply immediately. The logjam has been cleared. The, the backlog, they've caught up with a backlog on PPP. The lenders are having a much smoother time submitting the application. So don't lose faith. If you haven't been able to get through, don't give up. There's still $150 billion left. Um, my thought is that that funding will likely be expired by Friday. If uh, history, the, the short history that we have around this uh, loan program is um, uh, stays, you know, on par for the course, we should be fully expended by Friday. So please submit your applications this week. Don't waste any more time. Uh, and as a quick reminder, you do not need to have employees to apply for the PPP program. It's available for self-employed um, gig workers, independent contractors, people who have uh, sole proprietors, uh, people who have businesses with just one, as, as one business owner with no employees, you can all apply for PPP. Basically your net profit is the equivalent of your payroll amount that you would use to calculate the loan amount that you want to submit for. Um, and there's a, a bit more information I can give is if, if, and I'm not a tax expert, but if you look at your schedule C for 2019, if you're starting to prepare your taxes, um, schedule C line 31 is the reflection of the of that income uh, and again you take the average 1 12th multiplied by 2.5 and that is the loan amount that you can qualify for the other good news last week that we had heard was that the idle program was back up and running as of last Tuesday I believe the portal reopened um, that program unfortunately is still limited to only ag businesses which i know for this call we're with the slow downtown association with our local downtown retailers restaurant owners not a lot of applicability there uh, if you do know farmers growers they have absolute priority on idle at this time so we should encourage them to apply um, there was discussion on friday from the sba that they've given priority to our ag uh, producers last week that possibly today or tomorrow idle will reopen for regular businesses 
And again, uh, there is a conscientious effort to prioritize smaller business rather than large production facilities. So, uh, or large, larger businesses. Um, we will let you know as soon as we know. Uh, we will definitely put out an e-blast. I will, Bettina, I will contact you directly as soon as we find out that Idle opens up to regular uh, non-ag businesses. Uh, we'll be sure to, to let everyone know as soon as we can. So those are the latest updates for now. Uh, we're still available, still here to help. You can contact us at SLO, SBDC, at gmail.com. That's our hotline for loan assistance. SLO, S, B as in boy, D as in dog, C, slowsbdc at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. And that's good news about the idol. We'll look forward to hearing from you about that. Do you have any indication from your um, higher ups at the SBA that there will be additional funding coming through the CARES Act and that this is a two part question. One, will there be more funding coming? And two, is there any indication that other organizations may become eligible for the PPP funding in the next round? PPP is already pretty broad. Uh, it does cover, um, uh, you know, the self-employees, nonprofits can apply, um, cooperatives. It's a pretty broad. It's all right. I don't know much how much more they would expand it as of this time. I'm specifically asking about 501c6s. Yeah. So I know. Uh, I, I have no information about that. Uh, C3s can apply. Uh, C6s is true, is a, is a different category, and it's a, it's a bit more of a, a struggle for those nonprofits at this time. Um, no additional information about that. There are quite a few bills that have been submitted at this time. Um, one that I don't have at the tip of my fingers, but um, I maybe as the webinar is running i will find the bill and post it on the chat but there is an additional bill for additional funding that was submitted last thursday or friday um i think it was kamala harris submitted the bill to request for another um you know i, I want to say it's in the 150 billion dollar range uh an amount of funding that we specifically reserved for very small Main Street business. Um, so I will pull up the bill right now and I'll post it on the chat, but that is going through legislation right now. I don't know if it will be approved, but there are a number of bills that are being submitted for additional funding, yes. Now, whether or not they'll be approved and um, or not, we have to keep an eye on it. Thank you, appreciate that clarification. Okay, great. Um, and now I just want to call out the fact that um, Cal Poly did make an announcement last week um, that they are still in flux about their fall semester, but the summer, not semester, sorry, quarters, um, but the summer sessions will be taking place virtually. So that's some helpful information for those of you who may have been counting on having some Cal Poly students return to the downtown, uh, they will be staying at home. So just a quick update on that. Um, and now I'd like to call Jim D'Antona from the Slow Chamber of Commerce. Jim, are you on the line? I am. Thanks, Bettina. Yeah. Thanks for having me here today. I uh, always appreciate this and getting a chance to hear what's happening new um, here at the Downtown Association, Downtown Slow. Um, what we're working on, we um, obviously have been working on our webinar series. And last week's we had a, a conversation with uh, Guy Savage and Derek Johnson talking about the START Guide and what it really means uh, for us here um, and how will that process work. And I think, you know, as uh, Derek might uh, talk a little bit more, we're gonna see some, you know, changes and, and uh, we're gonna have to pivot a little as we are during this uh, time in flux and um, so uh, you know, this Thursday we're gonna do another version of it to talk about it uh, we're working with the county to exactly who it'll be but we're hoping to talk a little bit about uh, the state rules guidelines and how those stages actually re relate and additionally what those triggers are from a public health standpoint um, to understand what the statistics are what does it mean the one per 10,000 new cases? Is that any new case 
of, because you do more tests and you're gonna find new cases or is it community spread? What does that look like? And so that's what our webinar will look at. Additionally, Fridays uh, we're doing a new thing and this is more of a connection piece for our community, uh, working lunch. If you don't wanna be depressed by the governor's noon briefing, uh, we're over on Facebook Live uh, talking to some of our community members and I, I see one of them here, our, our one from yesterday, our last Friday was uh, Kevin Harris, that's low rep, uh, he was our guest. Uh, this Friday will be uh, Jordan Cunningham, uh, the assembly member, would love, we really wanna hear from him how Sacramento is uh, in light of uh, COVID and you know, it was uh, kind of a crazy place before. I'm sure it's uh, been ramped up. And then finally, obviously, we have our uh, Comivo, uh, who's a company, a software company, who actually wants to give out a grant um, to companies uh, who are suffering during the COVID crisis. Uh, we're helping them administer it, but it's really Comivo that has stepped up to put $75,000 um, in grants together. Um, uh, minimum five thousand uh, dollars. Um, so, with that uh, deadline, you can find on our website at slowchamber.org and let us know. You know, uh, apply for that. I will say the numbers have been huge in a sad but um, you know sobering way to see how much need there is in the community, and there will be no chance that we'll be able to take all those applications. But um, if you are a company, a mostly for for-profit company that wants to do that, head over to our website, go ahead and submit that application. So thanks for letting us share that information, Bettina. And, um, thanks for letting us be here. Thank you, Jim. And uh, that's great news about that fund. Um, too bad that it probably will be ex expended soon. Um, do you have any idea what the criteria is that the, the gifts will be evaluated for? No, so the, the, well, I do, I mean, I know some generics. They do want to look at companies who have been um, re mostly not been able to open at all. Um, if you've lost 100% of your revenue, those are the people they want to give priority to. Um, and additionally, for-profit, whereas some of the nonprofits have had opportunities through other foundations, this one really wants to focus specifically on for-profit. They're not making that a, a complete um, ban against nonprofits. There may be great arguments for why that would and they may make that decision, but they are trying to focus on the for-profit uh, business community um, who have not been able um, to, you know, maybe the non -essential, essentially the non-essential businesses that have suffered about, you know, the 100% decline in revenue uh, have been, is their priority. And Jim, do you have to be a member of the slow chamber to apply? Not at all. Uh, in fact, this doesn't have to do with the chamber. We're just, we're just helping Comevo because uh, once you saw the amount of applications, they need some help administering and we've done some of that help. So this is open to any uh, business in the county um, and you do not have to be a member of the chamber. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Sorry guys, gosh, you think I would know what I'm doing by now. Um, we have a new member of our call, a new voice and face on the call. And that is um, actually a familiar face to many of you. Uh, Lee Johnson has returned to the city of San Luis Obispo as the interim economic development manager. So Lee, uh, we'd like to welcome you to our Monday morning Zoom calls and take it away. All right, thanks Bettina, uh, good to be here. Uh, just sound check, you guys can hear me, correct? All right, perfect. Um, yeah, Lee Johnson, I um, back at the city. I started at the city in 2013. I was there for about five years and then went to the private sector and that uh, private sector business was wiped out by COVID. So I was at home and uh, the city asked if I'd come back and help with the, on the economic development front. And so I was glad to do that and I'm back and doing it. A um, couple things real quick. Um, I was asked to give an update on the, the parking arch mural and um, that it, there'll be a press release from the city coming out, but that is basically all set. And I really appreciate the input that uh, the downtown group had in that. 
um, and then on the Marsh Street Bridge, that uh, there was an article in the Trib on Friday uh, about that, and it's moving ahead as um, as planned, and it will be December when it will be done. There was some question about why we weren't starting sooner, and most of that, the, the schedule is driven by when we can be in the creek itself, which is until June, and so that's kind of the driver on the schedule. Um, and then, just so everybody's aware, uh, as mentioned earlier, there's between the start guide and the the resilience roadmap from the state, there's some differences in how that lays out. And, and the, you know, the county has said, and we will be following the resilience roadmap and everyone's trying to get that aligned. Um, we understand there's confusion. Um, so we updated the hotline that the city has over the weekend. Um, and when you call the hotline, which is 805-783-7835, at that number, you can hit press one and you will get the chance to talk to a business ambassador or leave a message and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. There's also um, on the city's website, slowcity.org, if you go to COVID-19 information and scroll down to uh, the business resources, there's a link to submit a form that if you have questions about reopening and how that works and everything that we can fill out. And if you fill that out, or respond to you via email or give you a call and get those things worked out. You can also email me directly at ljohnson at slowcity.org um, and I will help you as quickly as I can with any questions that you have. And then just to re-highlight the county's phone number, not everyone seems to be aware of it, but the, the county has a phone number 805-543-2444 where you can call with all COVID related questions um, and get assistance there. So that's it for me. If you have any questions, let me know and I will do my best. Uh, oh, one other thing, uh, talk with the chamber this morning and it looks like the coalition of chambers um, is looking at how to get together a list of PPE providers uh, for businesses. Had a lot of requests about that and as soon as that's available, we'll link it on the city website. That's it, thanks. Great, thanks Lee, it's good to see you again. Um, worked with you in a former life and good to have you back, so thanks for stepping in. Um, and now we have another Johnson, no relation, and I believe not connected to Johnson Avenue either. Um, but we have our city manager, Derek Johnson here. And um, really, Derek, I wanna say thank you for being such an amazing proponent of our downtown. Um, through this whole process, you've been so supportive and I know that you're an advocate for, for what we try to do in our neighborhood. So thanks for being on the call today. Great, thanks for having me this morning, Bettina, and good to see all of your faces. Um, can't wait to see you all in person uh, when it's, the time is right. Um, as many of you know, the city's been working very hard with our uh, county partners to make sure that we're holding space for that when the time is right for us to return, that we have a downtown, a community to, to, uh, to come back to. And so uh, we have been uh, working is, uh, in record speed. I think the governor said last week, what used to take years now takes months, what was months, weeks, weeks, days, days, hours. And so we're making decisions in real time to uh, really respond to uh, business and, and resident uh, needs. Um, and so just to, to give you kind of a, a big picture and is that, um, you know, I, many of you, and I appreciate uh, Judy being on all these calls. I know that the federal um, CARES Act uh, legislation has been complex. Um, many of you may or may not know that there's been various different attempts to uh, put in funding for, you know, the 17,000 plus cities and and counties throughout the United States that are also being impacted. Um, we're, we are, as a city, the people that provide uh, you services, um, we're also experiencing the same impact. When you're impacted by and, by, and your business, it impacts our budget. And so I'll be going to the city council on June the 2nd with a proposed uh, budget update. And if you understand our budget process, normally it's a nine month cycle in which we develop a tier year financial plan, we develop a capital improvement program and major city goals, et cetera. And frankly, a lot of that is we've had to completely reevaluate um, just in light of seeing a 13 to 
15% uh, revenue loss. And that's just on what we know. I think everyone realizes that all of the crystal balls that we've used to do forecasting, they've been smashed and there's not a reliable crystal ball to pick up off the ground right now and figure out where we're going. And so our approach is gonna be to come forward with um, um, nearly $5 million of initial cuts in, in June, and then we'll come back in October when we really have a, a better chance to take a look at where we're at. Uh, we're, we are really focusing on economic resilience and recovery. We have a meta goal that, we'll be, that staff will be proposing that will essentially encapsulate um, all of ev every city employee who's working here on economic recovery, resilience, and then continued attention to uh, public, uh, public health. Um, shifting to, to um, public health, and I, I understand and can appreciate all the confusion that's been out there. Um, I would say that our um, county, um, out of all the 58 counties, we jumped in early on. And the, and the end of March, as we started to do some advanced planning and thinking, we recruited uh, a group of medical professionals to advise us specifically on the unique aspects of our community, that we were a tourism community, that we had a major, major university, we had a state prison, we had, um, uh, we had a community college. Um, and so took all these factors into play and ultimately developed our own plan about proposed um, phase reopening. Um, and our public health officer, Penny uh, Bornstein, who's at the county, um, who we uh, get to interface with um, on an ongoing basis, you know, she's made uh, very vocal pitches to the state about the um, efficacy of our plan and the plan that the plan is ultimately customized to deal with the unique, unique aspects. I would say that you know, late on uh, last week, you probably uh, heard that the state determines ultimately how every single county is going to reopen uh, based upon the ability for the state for each county to meet the state set of criteria. And um, ultimately, uh, what we, uh, what the county did last week, and you heard read about that in the paper, is that uh, the county board of supervisors approved some attestations from the public health officer that we were ready to begin stage two uh, to allow in-store retail and in-restaurant dining to reopen with physical distancing and other protective uh, measures. Uh, we have not been granted that. And so largely, um, I think that uh, late last week, um, the county and all the cities realized that the START plan was a great body of work. It helped us have conversations about planning and readiness and specific strategies for dealing with our county. But ultimately what the state has put forward really is a pres prescriptive plan for the entire state. And largely what you heard from the county this weekend is that we're gonna be following um, the phases um, from the state plan. If, if I could ask Rachel, if you wouldn't know, I see that popping up online, is the roadmap from the state is up there. That will provide you um, some details that for your specific industry and the guidance. It's not, I spent some time on the site yesterday um, and this has been a fairly fluid uh, situation and there are gaps um, in, in the state guidance. And so we'll be working with uh, Lee who will be working through the county to try to make sure where there's gaps in guidance, how are we filling those gaps? You know, for example, congregate living facilities, you know, whether that's a senior care facility, et cetera. Our plan had details about when and how those were gonna open. The state, at least from my uh, review yesterday, does not have those details. And so we know in uh, the outreach that we did on our start plan that that's what the business community wants. You want some certainty, just tell us what we gotta do and you know, um, then help us and be available to uh, walk us through the process on, on how to achieve uh, those goals. So that's what um, Lee um, uh, Johnson is going to be doing uh, this weekend. We, repurp we repurposed um, the essential um, and non-essential business form. And um, if uh, Rachel, I'm gonna go ahead and just pop in here in, into the chat box, the link um, to our 
uh, site, if, and this site is intended to be uh, our business ambassador program so that we have a, you have a direct conduit to the city up to the county to get you quick answers that you need when it comes time for the state, when the state allows you to open up your business. And so our job is to try to you know, be that advocate and voice for the business community, use our connections with the county, and then all the way up into the state so you've got the clarity. I know many of your industries have, are doing a lot of this work already. Obviously, it's in your business interest to, to do some of that. You know, I've had I spent some um, time previously talking to uh, Stephen and folks in the hospitality industry, and a lot of you have, are already thinking about, uh, and your industry is thinking about best practices far beyond what the state has provided, because obviously you understand uh, and your business understands um, the business interests and make sure you're doing the right thing. Um, we've also been thinking about, and I want to appreciate the downtown, uh, uh, downtown slow for its work. And I know that um, council member Pease presented information last week. We're trying to also figure out how do we make, we change the, the landscape in downtown so people can physically uh, uh, distance, whether that's the expanded dining program and sidewalk program in downtown or just expanded retail. And I know that Downtown Slow put out a survey and we've gotten some good feedback. We had a call late into Friday night um, with some of our environmental health, public health uh, partners uh, to get um, feedback about some of the layouts and whether or not they specifically address some of the concerns about um, physical distancing when people are eating, et cetera. Uh, and we're prepared as a city to make those investments on behalf of the uh, downtown slow. Um, part of the budget that will be moving forward, uh, we've, we'll be moving forward with over $300,000 in funding to, uh, to uh, build those spaces in the downtown. We'll also be repurposing some of our CIP program uh, specifically to buy a few hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment for cleaning, specifically scrubbing and, cl and cleaning our sidewalks and other areas. And so we, did, we think that these are the types of investments that our community and our visitors and our business owners are gonna wanna see um, in our downtown for people ultimately to, to uh, feel safe. Uh, jumping back to um, um, the expanded dining program, I just want to just you know emphasize that this is intended uh, to be a turnkey program that essentially we deliver the whole platform, deliver everything. Here's what the signage you can put on the platform. Um, here's how you can use it for your exclusive uh, use. We'll handle all the permitting side, essentially give it over to you, and then you have exclusive use to use that for um, th those intended uh, purposes. Um, I did was asked to talk a little bit about um, compliance uh, with the county and state orders. Um, yesterday, um, our uh, compliance line we we did receive it was our our largest uptick in calls. We received 21 calls yesterday, and so the process is we go out and make contact um, with uh, the business community or uh, with uh, residents. And uh, typically we have a conversation about what is allowed and what's not allowed. We have found uh, through that process that we're able to get compliance uh, fairly quickly. And I think large, and, and some of it is born out of the confusion between the state and local orders and, and, uh, the, the, uh, um, and some and things that have come out of the White House. And so after having conversation about what's allowed and what's uh, appropriate, we're usually able to uh, get that compliance um, after having that uh, conversation. Um, I'll just close with, and you know, just uh, that we're here for downtown slow. We're here to help you reopen. I know that all of us are, are thinking about that and also thinking about at the same time, the public health aspects and, um, tr and, trying, to, and trying to weave that line up, up for what's appropriate um, for um, uh, downtown and what's the appropriate modifications that we need to make and investments we need to make uh, so that when downtown is ready to receive visitors uh, that we're prepared to, to accommodate those. With that, uh, Bettina, I'm sure to, uh, it, there'll be some questions. 
Hey, thank you so much, Derek. <clears throat> really helpful to hear from you directly, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, one challenge that we've had is sort of understanding the intersection between the safety and science of the public health emergency, the business and commerce necessity of the economy, and then customer and consumer confidence. I'm wondering if you've had any conversations internally about what you see this next month or six weeks looking like in the city of Slow. You know, the, um, you know, uh, that's an interesting question. I think, you know, as you look ahead and you think about the countries and the parts of the world that are ahead of us, whether it's Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, mainland China. And I was uh, reading an article yesterday that looked at, you know, the, you know I know in the, for restaurants, you're know, looking at the number of turns on tables. And they were seeing even after in some areas of China, Singapore, or maybe uh, China and Hong Kong, roughly about two thirds of the turn, you know, of, of tables, for example, of what they'd see, uh, seen prior to COVID. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, what I'm reading these days talks about the 90% economy uh, for some time. Um, and, uh, and so, I, and I think that speaks to the, to the perception. Um, you know, obviously there are gonna be individuals as we reopen who are gonna have greater levels of, of comfort coming out and, uh, and re-engaging in uh, shopping and dining, et cetera. And you're gonna see parts of the uh, community that that isn't for them ju uh, just yet. May not be, uh, they may not be ready to do that until a vaccine or um, really adequate uh, therapeutics uh, come along. So um, I think we have to brace ourselves that um, customer sentiments and attitudes are going to be uh, radically different in, in some way and, um, and how we ultimately then think about what that means for, uh, for reopening. Great. Thank you for that thoughtful response. I did notice uh, two weeks ago, the city installed a number of hand washing stations throughout the downtown. Thank you for that investment. I'm curious if you've seen um, or if you know if those hand washing stations have been used and are there any other additional um, health and safety initiatives aside from the equipment that you mentioned purchasing that the city is investing to make downtown um, cleaner and safer? Great question. That was part of our conversation with environmental health on Friday is uh, ultimately beyond the scrubbing, cleaning, trash pickup, et cetera. What are really efficient ways that we can spray down benches, um, trash cans, um, et cetera. Um, and we'll be investing in some Hudson sprayers and, and, we've, uh, and we were able to on Friday get the right solution from environmental health that we can use to spray down uh, some of these areas. And I think Gavin is on the line as, as well. Um, and he could certainly help me here if I, if I get this wrong, but my, uh, we're also proposing to move forward with a potential, we're looking at ways to change um, how we do parking perhaps, um, because there's, you know, all of those meters are all touch points and, is there, and uh, cleaning all of those uh, parking meters on an ongoing uh, basis is, is uh, pretty tough. So um, what, there might be some technology or different ways that we're looking at to minimize um, those uh, touch points as well. Thank yeah, you. Derek. Uh, we're looking at some uh, frictionless parking solutions. Um, so for pay stations and mo uh, bringing mobile app payments to downtown Slow. Thanks, Gavin. Great. Well, Derek, we know that you have about um, a million balls that you're juggling right now. So thank you again for your commitment to downtown. And um, please let us know how we can continue to be a service to the city and how we can work in partnership with, with your staff and your team to make sure that downtown is, is ready to reopen when the time comes. Yeah, and, and thanks, Bettina. I would just say that, you know, we're all ears. We're doing um, what we think is right at every turn, um, but, and we are open to feedback. If there are areas that you're hearing from your membership or gaps that you're seeing from the community, we wanna know about those. Um, we, we don't profess to, to, be, to have all the answers and all the ideas, and so some of the best ideas come from you. Um, you know, we're a, we're a, we're a town historically 
of uh, collaborators and co-creators. And so that kind of spirit and uh, ingenuity is the kind of uh, thing that will move us forward. So we really need to hear, keep the dialogue uh, open and we want to hear from you. Thanks, Derek. Um, with that in mind, I did want to just um, play a little bit of a part in describing what our role as downtown um, is for, for providing the information that's needed to our customers and to um, our businesses as we reopen. I understand that this has been a confusing time. It's frankly been confusing for me as well. Um, and as we're all working to unveil and decode the information as it's coming from the state, from the county, um, from the city, from all the different cities, um, and so many different pieces of facts and opinions that are coming out every single day. I just wanted to highlight a few um, points and I'm hoping that because we are all neighbors in downtown that we can remember that our first role is to be a good neighbor. So we need to be patient and we need to be kind to each other. We need to be kind to the people who share our streets and our sidewalks with us. We really need to adhere to the guidelines, which I understand can be challenging, um, especially given the big announcement that came out on Friday about the state moving into stage two, which to be honest was really not that different from what San Luis Obispo County was in. Many of you retailers were already offering curbside pickup. The city has graciously created parking spaces for people to pick that pickup. So not much has changed. We have seen a number of the national chains start to open up, and that's an interesting kind of indicator. I know that Barnes and Noble is now doing um, pickup, uh, curbside pickup. They're opening today. Shoe Palace also open. And as we see our national chains model other behavior that is indicative of what's, what's in the guidelines in other states and across the country. Um, please direct questions that you have about the guidelines to the city and the county, and I think you'll find, as Derek said, that they're very available. Um, that form that was just highlighted in the chat and on Derek's slide will be really helpful. And I ask you all to model good hygiene and good behavior. Um, please wear a face covering if you're interacting with customers and keep six feet distance from people. I was out walking around on Friday and it was wonderful to see so many of you around downtown, um, but some people were getting a little close and I don't know if you remember the show Seinfeld and the close talkers, but we don't want to be close talkers in this day and age. So please remember to back up. Um, I was in the grocery store last night. They had a great loudspeaker announcement that six feet is basically two shopping carts. So if you can imagine that kind of space between you and the, the people around you, we wanna make sure that downtown is the epicenter for, for health and for safety, and downtown does not become an epicenter for spreading um, the coronavirus and creating sufferers of COVID-19, the terrible disease that has killed more than 80,000 Americans to date. So just a few reminders to you. Um, if you see me out and about, I will be wearing a facial covering, which is hard for me because I love to smile at all of you. Um, but please look at my eyes and know that I'm smiling and I'll give you a thumbs up. So with that in mind, um, we do want to know, want to remind you all that we are going to be going out and distributing some welcome back to business kits. Um, and Austin, our wonderful ambassador, is on the call right now. Austin, you can wave at everybody. Um, he is in the office. He go, he'll be assembling some welcome back to business materials. We were able to secure some of the PPE that you will need to get your business operating safety. We've partnered with um, a North County Distillery to get some sanitizer that we'll be providing to you. We have some face masks and some gloves that we think will also help. We are raising money, so if you'd like to support this effort, please, um, you can make a charitable donation to our Friends of Downtown SLO 501c3 organization. That will be a tax deductible donation if you go to downtownslow.com slash donate. So with that, we're gonna um, wrap up and go into the polls, Garrett. Okay, thank you, Bettina. So um, really interesting turn of numbers over the last week. Um, and so here's here you can see where people were last week. Your most immediate uh, need was for access to stimulus funds. But if we pivot forward one slide, you can see how that experience 
um, has changed over time. And you can see that uh, the red line um, reached a high the week prior with that selection of immediate access to stimulus funds um, and, and then started to come down. And you can see that immediate access to cash and loan um, has slowly been on the rise, as has uh, my business's unsure financial footing. So um, we're hoping that that is related to the, um, getting the relief that you need, um, but but that is encouraging numbers during what is um, a pretty sobering moment. So the numbers, your your sense of priorities um, are are giving us hope that that the recovery will be swift and and successful here locally. Um, again, most pressing concern is the the lack of short term revenue. Um, and we continue to see that our businesses have diversified very effectively. Um, and we know that that will continue um, as the stages move forward. Um, and these numbers have been holding um, pretty consistently throughout. Uh, your most pressing concern being the lack of short-term revenue, revenue from customers and clients. Um, and diversifying your businesses is, is about a third of that. And the need for training and assistance to get your business online, we can see that all of those that are interested in doing that have essentially pivoted and are offering online services. So kudos to all of you for that. Um, we know that uh, the downtown staff wants to be able to represent the um, items that are most pressing to you. Uh, and we continue to see that rent freeze or assistance is the number one issue um, that you're asking for the downtown staff to be able to represent. If we go forward, we can see how that has evolved over time. Um, and we see that perhaps influenced by PPP and EIDL loans, um, that some of the concerns over rent freeze and assistance have dropped, or perhaps maybe you've been successful um, with your um, uh, landlord in that. Um, and we are seeing um, now a, health, a, a tick up in health and wellness screening and or procedures. So hopefully in anticipation of uh, opening and, and um, increased business activity, remind you that the start guide published by the county has that addendum in the back that provides some good guidance for all of your businesses. So whereas all of the components of the start guide are likely not going to be used as we defer a lot of those issues of reopening to the state. Those, um, I believe, 15 guides in the back based on industry continue to be a good reference for you, um, as does the county and the city. Um, we look at um, where you are with your current employer employee payroll issue, um, and we're seeing you know, a diversification now. And if we go forward, we can just see how that has uh, changed over the time. Um, right now, we've seen an uptick in the number that are continuing with your pre-COVID um, staffing levels and not anticipating any changes in the near future. Again, we hope that that is because of PPP and we hope that we're able to open the businesses and, con and continue that sense of optimism beyond um, the, the eight weeks of relief that PPP will be providing. Um, and we've seen a drop, that blue line in um, the uh, number of furloughs seen. Um, and then moving forward, um, did your business apply for assistance? Um, and we're seeing that the vast majority of you have applied for both PPP and EIDL. Um, and we're gonna launch um, that poll right now while we're going through these numbers. Uh, and then we have one more poll at the end. So if you'll participate in the CARES Act um, poll, uh, Bettina, I'll throw it back to you. Great, um, thank you. Sorry about the chaos there with my slides. Um, I got some sticky fingers. Um, I also wanted to take a minute and answer the question that Stephen answered in the asked in the chat about our numbers of infection being low. And um, if, if we are relatively unaffected in our county, why do we need to stay aligned and operate with proper PPE? Um, Derek has given a great response to this question in the chat, but I'm also going to chime in and say that um, we have done a good job in this county of keeping our infection rates low. However, the disease does exist and the virus is still out there. So um, I heard Dr. Borenstein on a call last week talk about, and Derek mentioned this as well, that even though our county has done a very good job of mitigating and um, we don't have some of the rapid rates of infection of other parts of the state or of the country, um, we are in a high traffic area. As we know, we are um, on the 101. We're right between LA and San Francisco and there are a lot of travelers. And as the state begins to open up and as the, the, the country begins to open up, we will still have the virus will be present in our community. Um, furthermore, uh, adjacent counties have a lot of cases. Um, we know that travelers are coming in from those areas. Um, we are a destination from people trying to escape the heat. 
of the, um, the Central Valley and many of them come to the coastal regions to cool off. Um, and we're also a university community. So we have, we have a lot of travel in this area um, and we uh, also have some institutions that have been affected. So it really is, it's tempting to say, okay, well, we're doing well, so let's relax. But you may have heard about the, the great analogy of, okay, I jumped out of the plane. Um, it's time to take out of my parachute, but we're still descending. We're still in this. So everybody needs to do the right thing. I'm seeing some questions about um, by appointment shopping. Derek or Lee, could either one of you talk to um, the ability of retailers to do by appointment shopping? Is this possible and is this encouraged? Great question. You know, I think there was a there was some uncertainty before, and we and we were allowing it with physical distancing, one person at a time to to come in for. But that was for us essential businesses where physical distancing couldn't be accommodated. That question to just general retail, I don't know the answer, and so let us get back to you and get that answer out to the community of whether or not the state rules allow that. Thank you, thank you for that clarification. And I put that into the slide about being a good neighbor. So um, please strike that from the record and from your eyes. Um, and let's get some clarification on that. So we'll provide that in the Facebook business group. We'll provide some clarification out that on that today. Um, last week, I got a little bit emotional when I was sharing out a wonderful video that was put together from the Geraldo Family Community Roots Project. Um, that video was published on Wednesday. It's published on our Facebook, um, on our Instagram, and we encourage you to share it as well. Um, so just thank you again to the Geraldo Family Community Roots Project for putting that together and for highlighting so many of our friends and neighbors in the downtown. Another creative tip here, um, I just wanna thank all of the amazing artists and businesses that have put um, beautiful flowers in their windows for people to enjoy safely through the Mayflower Initiative. And um, I've long been a proponent of the arts ability to bring people together and to um, share our humanity. And I was reading a book this weekend called The Art of Possibility. Um, this book is, uh, was published in the year 2000 and I come back to it as a touchstone every now and then. Um, and I wanted to just read a little bit of a quote here because while we think about the flowers as just being a fun thing to um, to bring a smile to our face, there's also something really significant happening here at play. And this is that the arts bring human consciousness to bear on the flows of product and capital. They energize our interpersonal connections and they open new doors for invention and practice. Art is about rearranging us, creating surprising juxtapositions, emotional openings, startling presences, light paths to the eternal. So that's Benjamin Zander and Rosamund Zander in their wonderful book, The Art of Possibility. And while there's so much uncertainty going out there in the world right now, and as we all struggle to go through different phases and stages, and we worry about our own livelihoods, I just want to remind everybody that there's always an art and possibility. Today, um, Austin Bertucci, our ambassador, will be on Instagram Live with um, two featured businesses, Humankind, and um, the uh, Old Slow Barbecue have been donating funds to um, uh, feed first emergency responders um, and doing some great work as well. They have Mayflowers in the windows too, both of those businesses. So please tune in on, um, on Instagram to see Min Monday members. And I also want to talk about the fact that um, our uh, downtown slow is a part of a couple of different projects. So we have the Inspired Leaders Shaping Cities, the International Downtown Association, the California Downtown Association, Main Street America. And um, I was on a webinar this morning with the International Downtown Association um, CEO group, and they pointed out a really great resource, which is um, the International, no, sorry, the American Industrial Hygiene Org, and they have a website called Back to Work, Work Safely, and it has industry-specific 
touch points that are all for available for free download. And I would invite you to go in and look at those in addition to the resources that exist um, on uh, their website as well. I see a couple of comments out here. Um, one is that let's remember that the artists need to be paid, not expected to volunteer. And that's absolutely a wonderful point. Um, we have raised some funds for the Mayflower Initiative and we will be um, looking at ways to share that, that money out um, with the artists who did volunteer their time. Um, we also have a question about the State Board of Cosmetology in regards to possibly having their licenses pulled if you open. I believe that that may be um, because the state is using the tools that they have in order to prevent businesses from opening outside of the phases. Um, but I also see some, some response from Derek in that, that, um, in that chat. So I'm trying to read this in real time as well. Um, my understanding, and everybody can, can tune in and watch the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, he goes live on Facebook daily um, and gives some insight into what the state is trying to do to enforce um, the, the rules that are in place to stop the spread of, of this, this virus. So I believe that he is using the enforcement agencies um, to try to convince businesses not to go rogue. So that's my understanding. I'm not sure, Garrett, if you have any other in, insights into that. Um, I know there's also some conversation about ABC licensing and uh, this, is, this is frustrating and, and difficult. Yeah, Bettina, I'll just jump in real quick. At least what the governor said on Friday and kind of the message I think that's coming on down through is that, then it goes back to Stephen's question earlier, the, the state wants everybody aligned. And they will use all the powers that they have at their disposal, you know, within reason to keep people aligned. So if you have a state license, they're going to be watching that you're following the state's road, uh, resiliency roadmap. And that's the work we're doing to try and get aligned and make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, so we'll, we're working to get that done and we'll have more information. But again, if you have questions, you can call the county or you can call us or you can submit the form and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, I also think um, for those of you who are in industries that have associations, right, we are the downtown association. We um, work to communicate the value of people coming together in the downtown. We put on events, um, although not right now, and um, we provide resources to you. But each of you, if you're in the, um, in the cosmetology field or you're in a restaurant, there are state and, and national restaurant associations that may be um, providing more industry specific information to you. So um, I'm sorry, I don't have all of the answers to your questions, um, but we is available at the city. There is a county hotline as well. And I encourage you to reach out to people who are um, subject matter experts in your industry as well. So we do have our polls going live right now. Um, I thank you very much for um, stay, staying with us through this call. Our intent was actually to not go and use the full hour today, but um, we are just, you know, trying to share the information as quickly as it comes out. So we are coming up at 11 o'clock. I know that uh, many of us um, have other engagements today and the construction project that's happening next to my house has now started their jackhammer. If, uh, hopefully you can't hear that in the background, um, but it's a little bit more uh, distressing than maybe even a Jeopardy theme song. So um, can I we'll just keep... highlight that we have one additional question added to the end, um, which is a question about the frequency of these Zoom meetings. So we know that some of you don't participate in the polls because you may not be a member of the Downtown Association, but we do ask that um, you go ahead and answer at least question number six. That would be fantastic. So we get a sense of um, the interest in participating as we move forward. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Garrett. And thank you for being a part of these, these calls and for keeping us um, on track and safe. And also thanks to, to Rachel for um, being the, the chat room moderator over here. And thanks to all the Downtown Slow staff who have been keeping our spirits up and keeping our operations running. Um, and also thanks to the Board of Directors um, and 
please a reminder to all of our downtown slow board of directors that we will be having a closed meeting tomorrow at 730. So with that, um, I think we're ready to close the meeting. Anything else, Garrett, before we wrap up? No, thank you. I will uh, echo what you say. Um, Rachel is the person behind the scenes that makes this all look beautiful. And when something goofs up, it's probably me. So oh, me. me. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Rachel, though. She's doing an amazing job. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Be well. Happy Monday. I'll leave it open for about another 30 seconds so we can get as many people answering the poll as possible. Um, but great response to question number six so far, 91% would like to see this meeting continue weekly. So great affirmation of the value. Great. And the amazing leadership, Dina. <laughs>